الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك سبحانك اللهم لا نحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى وسلم على سيدنا وسندنا ومولانا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذريته وأهل بيته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا All praises to Allah All praises to Allah All praises to Allah who guided us to this who guided us to his Mubarak house for his Mubarak remembrance and we were not to be guided was it not that Allah had guided us O oh Allah to you his praises is commensurate with the majesty of your countenance and the greatness of your authority O oh Allah we do not limit you with any praise we can come up with ourselves rather we admit that you are the only one who knows the true extent of your praiseworthiness and may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon his servant and messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his servant and messenger, our Lord and Master, our beloved one, the chain that binds us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him and upon his family and upon his progeny and upon his wives and upon his companions and upon all of those who follow all of their way until the day of judgment. Amma ba'd. The basis for all views that we express regarding the deen because there are a, a, a huge a uh, uh, vast universe of views. If you ask anybody about anything, they'll tell you a whole number of different opinions. But the first thing I wanted to introduce was an usuli point. Usul is a, a principle point, a point of principle to which all other particular matters will return. Is what? That the way of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is the best way. And following the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is something that's predicated on love. It's predicated on love of the Prophet ﷺ. This is a love that people now in the West are grappling with. That they see the love of the, the Prophet ﷺ that the Muslims have, and it looks irrational to them, and it scares them. But it's not something to be scared of. It's something from which much khair and much mercy, and much uh, love, and much ease, and much harmony has come to mankind. It's a love without which other loves have no meaning, nor do they have any stability, nor do they have any durability, nor do they benefit one another. Because every other love will end up in the fire with the two friends, each of them will blame the other and say, you wasted my time, you wasted my time, except for the ones who loved each other for the sake of Allah. That love of the Prophet ﷺ, which is described in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it says, لا يؤمن أحدكم لا يؤمن أحدكم hadiths are meaning لا يستكمل إيمان لا يستكمل إيمان أحدكم that your iman is not complete, it's not perfect. You do not believe until I am more beloved to you. Uh, one, uh, one of you does not believe until I'm more beloved to him than his parents and his children and all of mankind. And in a riwayah, حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ الَّتِي بَيْنَ جَنْبَيْهِ That I'm more beloved to such a person than his own nafs that's between his two sides. And love is something that doesn't want or need negotiation. Love is something that you say, we hear and we obey. And it's something that, that you put over and you prioritize over other things. And that's what it is, it's the love of the Sunnah that makes us want to do everything according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. In general and in specific, what we're talking about is based on that idea, that understanding of Islam that we want to do everything with regards to what we eat and drink according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To be sure, the act of eating and drinking and the act of sacrificing animals according to the usuliyin, according to the uh, masters of fiqh, according to the masters of sharia is from the qismul ibadat, it's not from the qismul mu'amalat. It's from the qismul ibadat, it's an act of worship, it is, not a, uh, uh, it is not a transaction from the transactions amongst people. right? Because we're going to say certain things 
We're going to say that animals need to be slaughtered in a certain way, foods need to be prepared in a certain way, and then people will come to us and say afterward that you live in the Stone Age. Look at you. Why don't you go ride a camel? Why don't you go back to uh, the country you came from? We're in the 21st century. We're in this and we're in that. And these derisive comments, these are things that people used to not say to one another in the Darul Islam regarding the customs of the Sunnah. These are attitudes that, that the Muslims had learned by taking from the kuffar that they, would, that they shouldn't have taken from them. What we should have taken from them is what? Science and technology and learning. And what we should have taken from them is remembering the things that our forefathers used to do, like wait in line and be honest and etc. etc. Be kind and polite to one another. Hikmatu dalat al-mu'min is the last property of the mu'min. We should learn those, but our people don't learn those things. They still can't stand in a line. They still curse one another. They still uh, 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 make takabur and tafakhur on one another based on class and race and all of these other things. But what do they take? They so said, we're going to wear uh, low-cut jeans and we're going to... All these things that we, we're not supposed to take from them. So these attitudes, these derisive attitudes toward the sunnah, these are not from the deen. And these are something that we, we shouldn't have taken from the kuffar, but we took from them anyway. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq of, 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 of making tawbah and returning to the path of guidance. So this is something, if you don't understand this point, the rest of what we're going to talk about tonight, much of it is not going to make sense. And what does it mean to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I don't want to belabor the point because we're talking... We're talking about something else. But it's very important that this sit down in the heart and the mind of a person before they understand why we're going, where we're going with this talk. It doesn't mean to love him with your love. It means to love him with his love. That the thing he loves, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is what's in your heart. Not that you love him with your own love. The thing that he loves is, in, is, is, is the love that you have. His love is in your heart, not your love. What does this mean? This is, sounds like a very abstruse uh, 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 thing to say. I'll give you a very concrete example. In the, Musnad, uh, in the, sorry, in the Mustadrak of Imam Hakim, the Mustadrak is a book of Sahih Hadiths. Imam Hakim, because Muslim and, and Bukhari are two great books in the, in the field of hadith. They are the two greatest of books in the field of hadith. But neither Imam Muslim nor Imam Bukhari ever claimed that every Sahih Hadith is in their books. In fact, both of them said this is just a selection. So a later uh, muhaddith in Naysapur, which is the city of, uh, uh, of Imam Muslim, he came and said, I want to gather hadiths that are like the hadiths of Bukhari and Muslim, but that are not in Bukhari and Muslim. So they're likewise in Sihah, they're likewise in their authenticity, but they weren't for some reason or another included in the books of Bukhari Muslim. So he made this book Al-Mustadrak. That's why if you look at the uh, Imam Nawawi's Riyadh al-Salihin, which is a very uh, dependable and reliable book, perhaps after the Qur'an itself, there's no book that's in Masajid more than the Riyadh al-Salihin. Uh, as a source for the Sunnah of the Prophet he takes hadiths from what? From the Sihah Sitta. Right? Bukhari Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Nasai, and the Mustadrak. Right? So this is a Sahih Hadith, this is not just uh, someone who's telling you stories right now. It's a Sahih Hadith that on the day of the Fath, on the day of the Fath when the Muslims conquered Makkah Mukarramah, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu who went to his father Abu Quhafa, and he brought Abu Quhafa with him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he should take the Shahadatain and that he should enter into the fold of Islam, and that he should take Bay'ah and put his hands in the Mubarak hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and take the oath of allegiance from him. The Prophet ﷺ says, why did you make this old man, poor old man, come all the way to us? If we had known, we would have gone to him. This is the shafaqah of the Prophet ﷺ. Sayyidina Abu Bakr says, no, I wanted him to have the ajr that he comes to you and that he says his shahadatain and he puts his hands in your Mubarak hands. When he put his hands in the Mubarak hands of the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidina Abu Bakr ﷺ, who started to cry. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, Ma yubkika, what, what's making you cry, Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he cried, he says, he says, what makes me cry, what, what makes me cry is that I wish this day that your uncle Abu Talib, his hands could be in your hands instead of my own father's. That if I could change my father's hands and put the hands of your uncle in your hands, I wish I, if I had the ability to do that, I would have done that. Because I know that you would have been more pleased that, that your uncle took the shahada than that my father took the shahada. And say, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa becomes sad at the dhikr of his uncle who passed from this dunya without entering into the fold of Islam that he loved and who did so much for his nephew. Uh, uh, and, and it was just the, the hamiyya of jahiliyyah that prevented him from saying those two kalimatain. He says, he says Sadaq, you, you, you've spoken the truth. 
Now what is it, Abu Bakr, is he like a mean person? Is he a, a jerk? Is he somebody who uh, is uh, uh, you know, mean to his parents and to his family? To, this is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So many of the Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu used to say, I'm nothing but a good deed of Abu Bakr. Why? Because he used to have so much mercy in his heart for other people. He used to buy the slaves that converted to Islam. They were getting beaten. He would buy them and free them. He, would, he spent everything he had for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. He wasn't a mean person. He wouldn't have sold his father out. He wasn't the type of person that sold his father out, would have sold his father out. But what? The love of the Prophet ﷺ was in his heart in such a degree that he suspended his own love and the love that was in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ became his own love. So remember that. If you agree with a particular thing we say or don't say, remember this. This is an asal from the usul al deen Anyone who tries to tell you anything about the deen other than what the Prophet ﷺ taught and what the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is about every single specific particular when it comes to the ibadat, when it comes to the acts of worship. Fine, don't go on a camel, go on an airplane. That's not an act of worship. But when it comes to the act of worship, worship of this deen. Uh, anyone who wants to deviate from that, that person has a deviated understanding, that person has an understanding that's not from the understanding of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. With that being said, I apologize, I'm not a Hafiz Qur'an, so I don't want to make a mistake in quoting. But there is an ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah regarding which a Yahudi asked Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu during his khilafah. He said, is it true that this ayah came down in your Qur'an? Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, yes. He said, Wallahi, had it come down on our ummah, we would have made that day an Eid. And Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that that day was for us an Eid. Why? Because it was a Friday, and it was the Yawm al-Arafah, and it was the Hajj al-Akbar, the Hajj al-Wuda' of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was that ayah that came down? حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخِنْزِيرُ وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ Made unlawful for you is what is the unslaughtered meat, the carrion meat and blood and the flesh of swine and that which was sacrificed for other than Allah وَالْمُنْخَنِقَةُ وَالْمُوْقُوذَةُ and the thing that has been asphyxiated, killed by asphyxiation and that thing that was killed by being beaten to death وَالْمُتَرَدِّيَةُ the thing that fell from a height and died from the fall وَالنَّطِيحَةُ and the thing that has been gored by the horns of animals وَمَا أَكَلَهُ سَبْعُ إِلَّا مَا ذَكَيْتُمْ that thing that uh, has been killed by uh, wild animals or eaten partially by wild animals except for those things that you can slaughter before its uh, uh, death occurs. وَمَا ذُبِحَ عَلَى النُّصُبِ And that thing that has been slaughtered in front of idols وَأَن تَسْتَقْسِمُوا بِالْأَزْلَامِ That you should use divination from arrows. ذَلِكُمْ فِسْقِ This is profligacy. This is sin. الْيَوْمَ يَأِسَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ دِينِكُمْ This day, those who disbelieve have given up hope that they should be able to assault your deen. فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي Allah Ta'ala says, don't fear them. So don't fear them. Fear me. الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَةِ وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ That this day I have perfected for you your deen and I have completed for you my favor and I have been pleased that Islam should be a deen for you. فَمَنُ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِلْإِثْمٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ And so that person who is, is, is starved or is forced uh, uh, not willingly through hunger and he eats these things or that person who uh, is uh, under stress or under obligation obligation has to eat these things to survive and he doesn't eat them out of uh, a wish to sin or rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful Allah ta'ala forgives sins and He is merciful now you have to ask yourself, the Mufassirin say this is the last of the ahkam of the uh, Qur'an. These are the, this is the last ayah that has commandments in the Qur'an. Other ayat came, but there's no other ayah that changes the commandments of, of the Sharia of Islam that came in the Qur'an. This came down on what? On the Yawm al-Arafah. This came down on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. The Prophet wasallam finished this Dhul Hijjah, and then he finished Muharram, and then he finished Safar, and then in the 12th day Awwal, he, he took his leave from this world and went to the companionship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most high. So it's about four months difference between this and the leaving of the Prophet ﷺ. And at any rate, it's the last ayah that came down in which there's a commandment. And this is the Eid of the Muslims. You have to ask yourself, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this? 
this topic, this topic which is the same topic that everybody in every masjid in America has been arguing about for the last 30 and 40 and 50 years. I was telling the brothers, even if the Mufti of Jupiter came down out of the sky, everyone will ask him two things, can I take a mortgage out on my house and can I eat the meat at Safeway or at the grocery store? And they argue about it, right? And it's become an object of ridicule and derision, we all laugh about it, to the point where nobody even wants to talk about it anymore. But it's important, brothers and sisters, it's not a joke, it's not a matter of joking, it's important. The beginning of the ayah mentions this uh, uh, eating halal, and the end of the ayah mentions the eating of halal, and what's in the middle of the ayah? Two things, one, that the kuffar have given up hope, they'll never be able to assail your deen, and the second thing is that this day your deen is complete. Why is this connected? Wallahu alam. Allah Ta'ala knows the haqqaq and the asrar of what He puts in His, uh, uh, in his uh, revelation and why He puts it in His revelation. But at any rate, a person should at least know that this is something that's very important. This is something that we don't want to blow. It's something that's really important. It's something that we don't want to blow off. And then Yom Al Qiyamah, Allah Ta'ala will say, This is, look at this. Is, I put this in the last ayah of the Quran and I connected it with the perfection of your deen and you didn't pay any attention to this? We don't want to show up that day. Whatever your opinions are about this matter, whatever my opinions are, you don't want to blow it off and you don't want to screw it up because of negligence or because of lack of foresight or because of laziness. Allah Ta'ala knows best what the secrets are of the, of the wahi that He sends down to His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, I see a connection between the lack of ability of the kuffar, the lack of the ability of those who disbelieve, be they of the ins or of the shayateen. The, there's a connection between the lack of ability of them to assault your deen and the perf perfectness and the totality with which you keep the commandments of, of halal. Why? Because this is something that was known to the Prophet ﷺ and to the Sahaba and to the Salaf al-Salih, the Tabi'een and the Ulama and the Awliya and the Salihin from that time all the way till this that if a person eats something or ingests something inside of their body which is from a good source and from a tayyib source it will make them do good things and it will make them do tayyib things and it will make the heart inclined toward the truth and inclined toward goodness. Ask anyone, there's mashallah people, brothers in this very audience I'm sure that have accepted Islam, they have converted to Islam. Out of every 10 converts to the deen of Islam, you will find that 9 out of them have stopped eating pork for some reason or another about 6 months to a year or longer before they became Muslim. Somehow for some reason or another they became vegetarians or some reason they've stopped eating pork and then all of a sudden someone gives them da'wah to Islam and it makes a lot of sense and they say, oh, you know this makes sense, let's, let's get with this program. My own brother-in-law, my own brother-in-law, I, I, wallahi I've only met one person, there was one brother, mashallah, he has many other good qualities but he says, yeah, I ate, well, I ate bacon the day I took the shahada and uh, 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 it was very difficult for me to get, get, give up. Every other convert I've met, all of them, they've all given up eating meat, uh, g eating uh, 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 the flesh of swine, some of them giving up eating meat altogether. And what did it lead to? It led to them, being, their hearts being open to hidayah. And what better good deed or what greater good deed could a person do than that? And we know people who have started to watch what they eat and it's changed their lives. It's changed their lives for the better. On the flip side, if a person allows that haram thing to come into their mouth and into their stomach and into the stomachs of their children and into the stomachs of their wives and into the stomachs of their dependents and into the stomachs of their brothers and sisters and their family members and then they wonder why afterward my wife doesn't listen to me, my children doesn't listen to me, my husband doesn't listen to me, this and that and the other thing, my children, oh, how come I yell and scream at them to pray and they don't pray? When they wonder why, I'm telling you this is why. Why? Because the unassailability of, of, of kufr on the heart of a Muslim and the eating of halal were mentioned together in this same ayah. And the Salaf al-Salih knew that's how they could tell. They had an extraordinary ken, they had a way of telling through supernatural means whether something they ate was halal or haram. Because the person who was reading tahajjud every night, every night, every night for months and for years, that person for some reason cannot wake up for tahajjud or cannot wake up for fajr. They say, what did I eat yesterday? They go and investigate and they find that something haram came into their food and it's, it plagues them for days on end. It comes in the athar that a person who eats something haram, his prayers and his du'as are not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 40 days. 
Now imagine all we do, we sit and talk about Palestine and we talk about Iraq and we talk about Afghanistan and we talk about the Muslims here and there and Pakistan is so messed up and India is so messed up and Kashmir is so messed up and this is Philippines is happening and Somalia and etc etc and we make plans about how we're going to establish the caliphate in the whole Muslim world. Actually brothers and sisters if you're eating something and it's not halal, right? You're eating something and it's not halal, it's something khabith in, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta'ala. And these are umur of the ghayb. These are umur of the unseen world. So you may not even see them. Just like you may see a person, their face is beautiful, their body is beautiful, their form is beautiful. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that person is ugly. You see them yawm al qiyamah, that person, you will not be able to look at them because of the ugliness. And you'll see certain people in this world, they look like uh, they look like uh, the, the, the poor people and they look like, you say, what is this guy? He sits in the masjid and reads Quran all day. Would that he went and got a job uh, uh, or went to school and uh, you know, became a doctor. It would have been better for him. Those people, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you'll see that these are uh, big shot people. They'll have entourages of angels moving, clearing the way for them. Right? You'll see the haqiqah on that day. This day, imagine if you're eating something that is khabith in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's coming into your, into your stomach and you're making big plans about fixing Pakistan and India and you think it's going to work? It's obviously it's not going to work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clean and pure and He only accepts the thing that's clean and pure. There's building blocks. You do, if you want to build the roof of the house before you build the uh, uh, foundation of the house, what's going to happen? If you build a house without foundation, even if it sits, a person can literally come and push the, push the house over. Even if it's made out of bricks, you can take a, a jackhammer and destroy the entire building within a matter of minutes. Within a matter of minutes, the Salaf al Salih they used to say that uh, for, they used to say that for me to know that I have eaten halal in a day is more important to me and more valuable to me and something that I've, I, I I am more concerned about than to know that I have prayed tahajjud for the entire night. Why? Because if the tahajjud doesn't happen, fine, you will reach the you know the sixth level of jannah instead of the seventh. If you what you're eating is not halal, Allah Ta'ala will not accept from you. And the athar about this are so many and so numerous. It's it would be exhaustive for us to uh, discuss it. That's not why we're here. This is just kind of getting the, the 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 oven warm before we get to the get to the main course. But I just wanted to uh, you know the athar of this is you ask Mufti Minhaj and you ask your imams and you ask your uh, uh, your ulama and ask us afterward. Also, we'll tell you the athar in the uh, uh, sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the athar of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum uh, uh, there, there are so many of them that uh, a person cannot uh, begin to enumerate them and for uh, a good reference for something like that I encourage people to read uh, the Hiyaul Muddin of Imam Ghazali or a book like that but shifting gears into what Mufti Abdullah's portion of the talk will be uh, I would like to add that this is important, it's important in the deen and it's important in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's important in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have uh, understood that and we've seen that and we've agreed to that. Now what would we do if we were do something, doing something important, right? Imagine, mashallah, there's some doctors over here. Imagine this is the day that you have to go and give your whatever last USMLE or your board exams for your specialization. We have businessmen over here, right? You've been working on a business plan for a whole year. You spent money on, on, on the business plan. You've hired people to make the presentation just right. You have a meeting with the investor who's going to fund your entire thing. And he has a line of 10 other people with ideas just as good as yours. And if you're three minutes late to the meeting, he's going to, he's going to pass you by. So in situations like this, Mufti Abdullah says to you, you know what, let's take the bus, it's cheaper. Let's take the bus. He says, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm not going to mess with the bus today. Even if I don't own a car, I'm going to go and rent a car, and I'm going to put gas in it, and I'm going to spend 10 times the amount of money that I would have spent going on the bus because I'm not going to mess, I'm not going to take a chance on this day. I'm going to go, I'm going to show up early, I'm going to sit in that place with my uh, packet or ready to give my exam, and, and I'm not going to mess with it. I'm not going to uh, 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 do anything that could jeopardize this. This is too big to blow. Why is it in the matter of deen, mashallah, ghafoor rahim? The same Allah Ta'ala is the one who's going to get you past your USMLE exam and get you funding for your business. He's the same Allah Ta'ala who's going to make your business deals go through. He's the same Allah who's going to get you a job when you uh, go to a job interview. He's the same Allah who's going to... And that same Allah Ta'ala, He's going to be the one that you, uh, you uh, get prosperity in the Akhirah from. Why is it that in one side, 
so much taqwa and then the other side lacks it. We have to be honest with ourselves, right? Because unfortunately one of the other diseases or sicknesses that uh, Muslim have, Muslims have picked up and it's something that they learned again unfortunately from the kuffar, they didn't learn the things they should have learned but they learned these things that you have this duality, this kind of schizophrenic uh, 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 identity regarding the deen and the dunya that you're one person when it comes this is deen Hamza and this is dunya Hamza and there's a separation between church and state. Separation between church and state is a good idea when your church is like crazy. <laughs> right? The church, the church when it's crazy and when it says that black people don't have souls and when it says, you know, uh, uh, that women are, uh, you know, are, are like this and when it says bad things about this race and that race and when it has no qanun and no sharia and when it, people go on pogroms and exterminate Jews and exterminate uh, other Christian sects and ex- yes, this is why because they were killing each other. Look at the history of, of, of the pre-reformation, pre-enlightenment Europe. They were killing each other. It was a curse for them. They got it off of their back. Our forefathers built empires on this on this deen. Our forefathers built empires on these precepts, both spiritual and worldly, that are given down to us from, from the Sharia. Why? Because they came from above the Sabah Samawat. They came from above the seven heavens. And they made our people who are jahils into people who are who are worthy of building empires and building states and worthy of being great people. So don't learn the schizophrenia from the other people. It makes sense for them. For them, church and state separate them. It's a good idea. It wasn't working out before. Right? But for us, even, fine, we're not going to build a country or we're not going to build a nation. At least you and your own person have a unified you. Don't be dhul wajhain, don't be dhul wajhain, don't be a, a person of two faces. Rather, the amount of taqwa you put into your dunya, right? at least that much you should put into your akhirah. It's uh, uh, closer to the uh, sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that a person should put more taqwa into their akhirah than they put in their dunya. But at least be honest and, and at least make some tasawi there. right? Make some tasawi, make some equality in the, the way you prepare for your akhirah and the way you prepare for your dunya. So that you won't be so ashamed that this is in fact nifaq, this is in fact a type of hypocrisy that we give lip service to the deen on one day and we uh, 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 do the asal khidmah, the actual, the original and the most important service we do for our dunya. So when it comes to halal, just say you agree with nothing that Mufti Abdullah is going to tell you right now. Just say you say that all these things that he says are haram are halal. Just say you think that he is unrealistic and he is giving you the Islam from uh, 10 centuries ago in the desert or he's come from India or South Africa or wherever and just say you believe all of these things. Still, is it within the line and the spirit of the Sunnah that you should leave the thing that has more doubt in it for the thing that has less doubt or not? Is this something important enough that if it turns out that you were wrong, right? This is not a matter of aqidah, it's a matter of fiqh. If it was a matter of aqidah, there would be no difference of opinion in it. Right? A person who accepts it is a Muslim and a person who doesn't accept it is a kafir. This is a difference of opinion in fiqh. Just in the definition of differences of opinion in fiqh is what? I believe that I'm right. But it's possible I'm wrong. And I believe that you're wrong, but it's possible you're right. If this is one of those matters, which it is, unless someone wants to come and bring a halal aqidah, that will be a, something different. But uh, Allah Ta'ala protect us from that. But if this is something like that, which even you believe is a difference of opinion, isn't it, isn't it good? Isn't it worthy that we should push the uh, customs and the practices of ourselves and our families and our communities in the direction that, that we choose the higher standard, the gold standard, the non-controversial standard, the standard that lets us sleep well at night, and the standard that, that, that our children will not curse us for choosing the wrong thing later on or for being, uh, uh, for being lax in something that they think that you should have been more tight. Our children will know that, look, my fathers, they did something good for me, they gave me the best. They gave me the best. Is, is, is that the course of action that we want to do or is it something that's so unimportant that we just want to let it go mashil hal the way it's going right now. And I'll tell you one more thing and this is the last thing inshallah before I wrap up and turn over the mic to uh, uh, my uh, uh, esteemed, I won't say colleague, he's like my elder brother and he's a person that, that I have a lot of respect because nobody, well, uh, nobody graduates from uh, madrasa and says I want to become a meat inspector. Nobody graduates and you're sitting and reading Bukhari, yeah, I want to I wanna go out and go city to city to tell people about which store they should buy meat from. Nobody wants to do that. It's not like, it's not like I have a vested interest or this is something I've been obsessed with. Just like maybe a lot of the people in this room, I grew up most of my youth eating this, that and the other thing. I didn't even care about it. I didn't really, I didn't care. My father is not a, a, 
uh, my father is not an alim, nor is he a person that people would think that are, is outwardly religious. He's a person of good akhlaq and he's supported me greatly in my work, but he's not a person outwardly that people would consider religious and we also didn't care about these things. But once the realities open up and they dawn on you, then you, your life changes. It can never be the same again. But this is the difference between the people of knowledge and this is the difference between people of nifaq. Is that people of nifaq say ignorance is bliss. I wish you had never told me so I could have stayed in the old jahil state because they love it more than the state of knowledge and the state of enlightenment. The people of knowledge say no. It may be hard on the nafs, but now that you open this, this reality for me, I'm happy for it and my life is better for it. Before turning it over to uh, 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 Mufti Abdullah to, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, shine some light uh, on everybody's world, even though it may be uh, something that the nafs doesn't like, I wanted to say this one last thing, that even if all of the things you don't agree, everything, I said, this guy's just hocus pocus, he's just blowing hot air right now. He's crazy, he's backwards, stone age, he's blowing hot air right now. At least this much to think about, and this is something that, that's recorded by the ulama of the Sira, that the Prophet Sallallahu the first thing he did when he came to Medina Munawwara, what was it? He built, he built the masjid, right? He built the masjid. Slightly less well known is the second thing that he, he had built when he came to Medina Munawwara. He asked the, the Ansar, he says, where is your market? Where do you buy and sell things? They said the Yehud, they have a market. They set the prices. We bring our goods to their market and we buy at their prices and we sell at their prices. Prophet says, why don't you have your own? And why don't you have your own market and you buy and sell your own things? If you want to buy something from them, you can go to their market. If they want to buy something to you, from you, they can come to your market. And so the second thing they did was what? They made the, their, their own market. It's absolutely practical. This is not a Stone Age idea. It's an absolutely practical idea. Right? It's an absolutely practical idea. This is what the Muslims have been doing uh, from the past. And this is how, what Muslims have done as minorities in different countries. Both of my uh, esteemed uh, elders, both Mufti Minhaj and, and Mufti Abdullah, they both studied where? In South Africa. South Africa is an interesting model. The Muslims over there are less than 1% of the population. So they're actually less nisbatan as a percentage of the population than, than the Muslims are in America. And numerically, South Africa is much smaller than America. So there's actually not that many Muslims over there. But they're overrepresented in government, they're overrepresented in education, they're overrepresented in everything. And when people draft policies, and when they draft uh, 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 public policies, and when they draft uh, 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 policies for business, etc., what do they think about? First they think, what are the Muslims going to say about this? Is something that the Muslims will like? And they control the means of their production and the means of their consumption. They control the means of their production and the means of their consumption. Meaning the clothes that they wear, they buy from Muslim businesses. The food that they eat, they buy from Muslim businesses. And they have best practices in place and they have halal practices in place. And imagine Muslims in America are something like somewhere between 3 and 5% of the population according to a conservative estimate. Because the way they estimate these numbers is based on national origin. So it doesn't uh, 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 put into uh, account the millions of African American Muslims in America and the bordering on a million uh, uh, Caucasian Muslims and Hispanic Muslims and converts, etc. It doesn't, it doesn't count any of them. So, conservatively, between 3 and 5 percent of the Muslim population. Now, if everyone is scattered and says, Ya khalas, bas, bi, kul bismillah, kulu halal, everything just, if everyone has this type of attitude that we built the masjid but we don't want to build the marketplace because a part of the sunnah, tubminuna bi ba'd al kitab wa takfuruna bi ba'd. If you want to take part of the sunnah and leave the other part of the sunnah, nobody is going to care about us. If you have 5 percent of the, 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 the population, population and just one out of all of these restaurants or one out of all these stores, just Burger King only, they, they decide, okay, khalas, we're going to call Mufti Abdullah and have him write our protocol for us and, and, and he's going to set halal for us. I guarantee you every one of the, the shabab over here are going to go and have a whopper at the, end of the, at the end of the thing. Burger King will be packed. It doesn't matter if there's depression, suppression, uh, recession. It doesn't matter what's happening. They're going, to be have, they're going to have business. People are going to be eating there. And then after that, all the rest of them are have, going to have to line up and appease in order for them to draw the business back. And eventually what will happen is a situation like you have in South Africa, where Wallahi, literally we stopped in the middle of the, in the, middle of the road, in the middle of nowhere. Right? It wasn't even a, a city, it was just a gas station. The whole like freeway exit was just a gas station, their rest area type things. Right? So I said, Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is like a movie sound like sweets, you know? So we go, go, I said, I want to get an ice cream bar. I got a Dove bar. Wallahi, that Dove bar, everybody knows Dove has no meat and has no pork in it as 
there's nothing haram could even possibly be in it, right? The Dove Bar has the little seal, the Sanha, South African National Halal Authority seal on it. Why? Because the Muslims, they, they own their, their means of production of what they consume. And economically, it's a, a, it's a integrated block, which is what? Which is the same thing, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ from before. That we shouldn't just all buy houses in the suburbs, live far away from each other and just see each other on, on Jummah or see each other on Sundays or whatever uh, time that is social in the masjid. No, that we should be integrated spiritually and socially and economically. So if you don't believe any of the other things I said, at least this much should make sense to a person. Uh, uh, this much is not Stone Age. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq inshallah of adopting all of these various layers and levels of, 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 of the sunnah when it comes to halal and when it comes to all other things and may he make it more beloved to us than, than, than anything else in life. Uh, wa sallallahu ta'ala wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in.